Hi, I'm Kim Ross. I've been a lake steward here on Ames Lake for about 10 years. I find the animals, the plants, the whole ecology of the lake completely fascinating. And I think you might too. So let's go see what's in the water. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the magnificent Bryozoan. The word Bryozoan comes from the Greek for moss animal. You can see why someone might have called this a moss. Bryozoans come in many shapes and sizes. They mostly live in the ocean or other saltwater environments. The magnificent Bryozoan is one of relatively few to make their home in freshwater lakes and ponds. So what are they? While the magnificent bryozoan might look like alien brains, they are actually colonies of microscopic invertebrates, tiny little animals without spinal columns. They have mouths, digestive tracts, anuses, reproductive organs, and even minuscule ganglion brains. Bryozoans share many similarities with coral, both in their adult stage are sessile or immobile, fixed to a substrata like a rock or stick. Like coral, most marine bryozoan species form their fantastical structures out of calcium carbonate. In the case of magnificent bryozoan, however, their structure is a gelatinous goo, secreted by the tiny creatures as they mature. In fact, the genus of the magnificent bryozoan is Pectinatella. But no, even though it is called pectin, you cannot use it to make jelly. Magnificent bryozoans are native to freshwater lakes, rivers, and ponds of the eastern North American continent. It's true. Magnificent bryozoans are considered invasive species in western lakes. In fact, they have arrived as invasive or non-native transplants in many places throughout the world. If you think of invasive species as beautiful plants like water lilies or purple loosestrife, you might be asking, why would anyone knowingly introduce blobs of alien brains into a freshwater lake? Simply said they wouldn't. The magnificent bryozoan gets there all on its own by hitchhiking. In order to understand how a creature like this might hitchhike, you need to know more about just how magnificent the magnificent bryozoan is. Let's take a closer look. When we notice a magnificent bryozoan in the water and wonder what species of frog eggs they might be, what we are looking at is a colony of tiny creatures called zoids. That fuzziness is their lophophores horseshoe-shaped feeding organs with ciliated tentacles which pull microscopic bits of algae, insects, and anything else that comes along into their mouths. You might notice that a bryozoan pulled out of the water is smooth, even shiny. This is because the zoids have pulled their tentacles in. Just like corals or barnacles or any other creature that uses tentacles like this to filter the water, they will open their mouths, so to speak, once the water returns. Bryozoans are voracious, but not very efficient eaters. They ingest masses of bacteria, chlorophyll, diatoms, whatever they can reach. In fact, that is the biggest danger invasive bryozoans pose to western lakes. They can clean the water too much, which lets sunlight reach deeper into the lake, allowing more plants and algae to grow, 
and upsetting the balance of the ecosystem. But they only absorb a small amount of the nutrients that pass through their digestive tracts. Most of the nutrients are expelled in their fecal pellets or poop. Yes, even individuals housed in gelatinous masses do poop. These fecal pellets drop to the lake floor, carrying nutrients that otherwise would have remained floating out of the reach of the zoobenthos, or creatures who live in the muck. These benthic organisms eagerly gobble up the pellets, much as you or I would gobble up a delivery from our favorite restaurant. Those little organisms, the zoobenthos, form the basis of the food chain for fish. Directly or indirectly, they are responsible for 65% of a fish's diet. As you can see, a lake really is one ecosystem continually cycling and recycling its nutrients. But back to our bryozoans and how they came to Ames Lake. Magnificent bryozoans reproduce three different ways as they grow and mature, building their colonies by secreting their gelatinous goo, they clone themselves, making more and more zoids. Each individual zoid in the colony is a clone of the parent zoid. Bryozoans can also reproduce sexually. Most of the zoids are hermaphrodites, containing both ovaries and testes. Zoids capture free swimming sperm from other zoids with their tentacles, pulling them into special ovicells which hold their eggs. The fertilized eggs divide and develop into free swimming larvae which escape from the brood chamber into the lake. Eventually, if they survive, they will settle on a suitable substrate where through metamorphosis they become a new zoid, the parent zoid of a new bryozoan colony. The third and strangest way that bryozoans reproduce is something called statoblasts, which are unique to bryozoans and are the key to their ubiquity and survival. Statoblasts form on a cord connected to the parent's gut, which nourishes them. As they grow, the statoblasts develop protective bivalve-like shells made of chitin. When winter or some other disaster hits and the colony dies and dissolves, the statoblasts float away holding the genetic code of their colony, keeping it safe. This is how they hitchhike. Those little spikes hook onto whatever they encounter, feathers, gills, bits of plant. Thus attached, they can travel immense distances. They can survive desiccation and freezing. They can remain dormant and viable for at least two years. If bryozoans were plants, you would call their statoblasts seeds. But bryozoans aren't plants. They're animals. Statoblasts are survival pods. When conditions improve, be it next spring or a spring three years hence, the valves of the chiton shell will separate. The cells inside will develop into a brand new zoid, and it will start the whole cycle over again. The best guess for how magnificent bryozoans first came west is that they hitchhiked on fish brought here to stock lakes. They might have arrived in Ames Lake when it was last stocked with largemouth bass and rainbow trout in the 1950s, or they could have arrived more recently with any number of species that travel between lakes. I first noticed them in the 1970s when they grew on our dock. However they got here, so far they aren't doing any harm. In fact, they might be filling a slot in the lake ecosystem that was at risk of being abandoned as another wonderful creature, freshwater mussels, have been disappearing from the lake. But we'll talk about that another time. Thanks for watching. We all need to do what we can to support the health of our lakes, rivers, and other bodies of water. One of the first steps is getting curious. What's in the water? If you have questions you want answered, let me know. And if you want to learn more about what's in Ames Lake, please like this video and subscribe.